Welcome back to Ox Tools. I'm Tom. So uh, I did a meatloaf episode recently, and uh, I think it was number 134. And I got some, actually, some really good comments. Some guys uh, asked some questions that, uh, and these are the best kind of questions. They got me thinking about stuff, right? So uh, like, oh, I never thought about that, right? Those are those are the really good questions, right? So we're going to explore a couple of those things here in this video. This is a little different. Um, we're going to explore some viewer comments. So uh, let's go uh, go play with some stuff and uh, check it out. Okay. So here's the uh, here's the pencil layout of, <clears throat> of the uh, uh, pentagonal bolt circle. So you got one, two, three, four, five points, right? So those would be our, our our bolt circle. So there's your bolt circle diameter, and then there's five equal spacing. So this is a geometrical construction, and um, I hadn't done one in a while, actually, so uh, I went, went ahead and went through it uh, just to kind of refresh my memory. But we're gonna go ahead and do one on, um, on some sheet metal here. I got some sheet metal that's blued up here that we're gonna do it on. Um, but let's talk about the let's talk about some layout tools here real real quick first here. So um, these are what we're going to use here, and um, two punches, a um, hammer, a combination square, and then just a a, a scribe too. So um, so you know most of this is pretty self-explanatory. But let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the two punches first. So this is a center punch, and this is a prick punch, and they're distinctly different. So for precision layout, uh, when we when we scribe very light lines with uh, dividers or uh, with scribers, um, to pick up those lines accurately, you need you need a, a sharper point than what a standard. Uh, uh, center punch has. So, and just so you know, that these are ground at, at distinctly different angles. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a typically 90 degrees included angle for a center punch, and then something like 65 or 70 degrees uh, included for a, a prick punch. In fact, let's go, we'll go take a look at. Uh, we're going to take a look at these points on the uh, on the optical comparator, so you guys can. It, it, it's not going to show up real good on camera here, so but we can show it on the optical comparator really easily on these small punches. So let's go do that. Let's take a look at these uh, different point angles on uh, the uh, center punch versus a prick punch. So we can actually look at them both at the same time, which is kind of cool. And the old optical comparator here. Right, that looks pretty good. So let's turn this on. Let's see. Can you see that? Alright, yeah, it looks like it's okay. Okay, so that that's the center punch there. And then let me slide this one into the frame. Okay, and then there's the uh, the prick punch. Let me get these in focus here. Okay. And you can see the included angle here is 90 degrees, and then these are, they're actually a little sharper than 60, you know, 70, somewhere in there. Um, but the idea is that it's considerably sharper than this, so this allows you to pick up a fine scribed line really easily. So these are never intended for starting drills. Um, these you just find, like, like this little crosshair here, right, you find that little intersection with the tip, and then you just give it a very, very light little tap, inspect the, uh, uh, that intersection to make sure you got it correctly, do any corrections, and then you come back with the center punch and uh, give it the beans and, uh, you know, for starting to drill or something like that. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, uh, the way these are used there, but you can see the difference there uh, in the point angles. Uh, and these are, uh, these are both stare at the, uh, um, a prick, stare at prick punch and a stare at uh, a center punch. Okay, let's go do some layout. All right, so let's uh, let's go ahead and start our layout here. So, um, you know, I see a lot of people uh, fussing around on um, on YouTube, and uh, you know, in particular, some of these knife makers. They got some really kind of I'm just going to say it crappy layout tools that they're laying out. Um, 
um, these very nice knives that they're doing. Now, ultimately, the finished product comes out really nice, but I just cringe when I see some of the uh, layout tools that they're using, right? Because um, there's better ways to do these things, right? And um, um, anyway, one of my personal favorites is uh, the good old combination square here. And this is a Starrett. Uh, forged and hardened, so basically last your your lifetime and your kids' lifetimes and their kids' lifetimes. Um, and you know, I did a lot of sheet metal work um, in uh, my previous life, and you get really, really good with one of these. In fact, uh, I have quite a few of these because um, there's uh, some advantages when you have a bunch of layout to do. Um, in particular with large sheets where you're working your way around from uh, corner to corner um, and there's a, a layout that's referenced to the corner, right? So if you have two or three uh, combination squares, you're not constantly resetting and it, um, um, it reduces your error rate too. So, uh, so say you have a layout that's one inch this way and inch and a five eighths this way, right? So instead of resetting your combination square each time, you just have two squares and you pick them up, um, in, you know, long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, right? And, um, um, and, you know, that's how you move faster. But for this, it's easy. We're just gonna mark a center point. I'm gonna introduce you to a quick concept here uh, called bisecting, okay? I'm not even going to measure the width of this plate. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the length is. But I don't really care either. Um, so I'm just going to eyeball. I'm just going to eyeball the, uh, you know, the the center point, right? Yeah, looks about right. Okay. And then, uh, and I got it up on this little block of wood so that the uh, the combination square can sit flat. Put a nice scribe on. And you see, I'm flipping it over, and I'm using that same that same dimension, right? And you can see that it's not exact, but it doesn't need to be. We're because these lines are close enough together that we can interpolate between them very accurately. So we're going to do the same thing in the other direction. So I'm just going to say, I don't know, does that look good? Yeah, it looks pretty good. Let's do that. Okay. Like that. Ooh, I got closer that time. Okay. So, by bisecting, right? So now I just have this little tiny rectangle to work in, and that the center lies within that little tiny rectangle, right? And, oops, uh, you know, I don't have my, uh, oh, my old man uh, optimizers here. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to use the prick punch. Okay, and we're very going to very gingerly put that in the center, and we're just going to give that just the tiniest little love tap, and I'm off a little bit. I can see that right now. Okay. Oh, actually, you know what? It looks pretty good. So give it a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've now established the center there pretty accurately. Um, and we're going to, in this particular layout, I think we're going to do, a, let's do a four inch bolt circle. I think this will, uh, this will hold a four inch, but yeah, okay, four inch will work good. And what I'm going to do is instead of uh, um, setting my dividers, um, normally what we would do is we would set our dividers by dropping into uh, the, uh, the graduation marks. What we can do, actually, we're still going to do that. Let's still do that. But what I'm going to do here is, is I'm going to set the radius by using the combination square off one edge, and I'm going to align that with my punch mark like that. Okay. And then I'm going to put a little tick. Okay. And this is, serves as a uh, as a little double check. Okay. That uh, we've got the uh, that we've got the radius right, you know, and you can just you can spot it and you can double check that you you did it right. All right, okay. So let's set the uh, let's set the uh, the dividers. We want to set that it's a four inch circle, so it's a two inch radius, right? I think I did that right. And when you're doing this kind of layout. 
you got to be real careful if you want to do it accurately. So what I'm doing is I'm lift I'm I'm lifting the legs up and feeling how they drop into those into those discrete machine engraved. Yeah, that feels pretty good. Okay, so these are these are quite accurate actually. So uh, and now we get this nice fine this nice fine little uh, little uh, dealy. Okay. All right, that's a nice circle. All right, and see, it's tan tangent to my other mark there. Pretty good. Okay, and uh, once again, just a, just a quick sanity check. Looks good. Okay. Okay, so the first, the first step in our pentagonal layout is we need a line, we need a line um, that uh, goes through the center and is the uh, on the diameter okay so a couple ways we can do that you could uh, you, I think we want it oriented with one of the edges that's you know just general workmanlike practice right basically any point that that and you see I put the scriber in the in the divot then I bring my my rule up to here right I could describe a line like this and and that would be the exact diameter right but I think I want to orient it with the edges of of the plate just to be because I'm so OCD right and I think what I'm going to do in this case is I'm just going to come up to my my divot there okay and keeping that same edge so I'm just going and you see what I'm doing I'm just sliding the square down like so line and it is going through that center okay all right okay so next step <laughs> this block of wood here all right so this next step what we need to do is we need to bisect the distance from the diameter to the center so we need a we need exactly halfway. Now there's a couple ways you can do that, but we're gonna use um, our technique of bisecting again, but a little differently this time. And uh, I'm going to put just the tiniest little, see this prick punch finds, it finds that scribe line, boop, like that. I'm gonna put a little Dingus McGee in there, okay? And once again, you, we're just going to kind of eyeball the center here. Um, I'm going to drop my dividers in there. I hope you can see all this. Yeah, I've never filmed a, a layout like this, and so I'm eyeballing the center here. But I'm also, I'm actually, I want to be on this this side of center from here. So if that's the center, I want to be a little bit on this side, and I'll show you why in just a second here. Because what I'm going to do, <laughs> with too much coffee here, do you? <laughs> okay, I'm going to scribe a little arc like this. Okay, and then without changing the dividers at all, I'm going to scribe another little line like that. Okay, and I get a little spread on these lines here. Okay, now here's the neat thing, right? Since we use the same arc, so the center, once again, lies between those two lines, right? But it happens to be exactly on that intersection and that intersection. So what we can do there is very carefully put our scribe tip in that, bring a straight edge up to that, and then rotate, rotate the rule until it intersects the second Okay. All right, and there's there's our bisection, our bisection of uh, of this particular line segment here from the center to the diameter. Okay. All right. All right. So we got that. So now we actually we actually need a line this way too, uh, or certainly be helpful here. So a couple ways we can do that. Um, we could do it like this, or we just use a combination square since we were 
we were clever ahead of time. We just come off of this edge, make sure that we're going through our little center dot and then scribe a line. That's like probably the easiest. Okay, another way we could do that is you can use the dividers. Okay, and let me just, and we use that, that same principle of, of bisecting. Okay, and we can, um, we can scratch a line here, and then we can come over here and we can scratch a line here, and then that gives us two points, which is pretty good. Um, or four point, or three points, right? So we can come down, we can come down here as well. So when you do a lot of sheet metal layouts, this is one of the things that they, they teach you is, you know, with, uh, with a combination square, a rule, and uh, some, um, some dividers, uh, you can create pretty much any kind of transition or cone or whatever you want. Okay, I'm just gonna do it this way because I'm really lazy. Okay, and you hear that click? Because we went into the, the punch mark, okay? All right, so now these are, these are at right angles to one another, okay? So our next move, so we created this point here. Now we're, now we're getting ready to really do the, um, uh, really do the pentagon here, because we're gonna start right at that little point right there. And I'm gonna put a little, a little prick punch in there. Make sure I got it, yep, that looks pretty good. Okay, all right, and now what we do here is from that bisected point, we want to swing an arc that goes through that intersection right there, that little intersection at the diameter. Let me crank these down. Now when you're trying to, so there's no, you just have to do, you have to do a little siding sweep, right? You don't want to do it full pressure. That looks pretty good there. Okay. And we want to catch this line here, like that. Okay, so that arc is from the bisection of the radius there to that. Okay, and this is really our starting point now. So that's actually one of the points of the of the pentagon. Back to here, you can see that. Okay, all right. So let me pop that one too. I'm gonna give that one a little, a little dingus McGee, and I hope you guys are following along with this here, right? Because I always like this kind of stuff. This is a uh, this is fun, fun, fun business. Okay. All right. All right. So the next the next step, and this is going to give us the second point of uh, or the second hole in our in our pentagon is what we want to do is we want to swing an arc from from this point to this intersection right here, okay? And you can see that the distance from here to here and the distance from here to here, this is not the same as that, okay? So um, let's, uh, let's get on that. I'm gonna open it up a little bit, do a little test sweep, okay? And then I'm gonna sweep all the way out to the uh, radius and I wanna sweep through that point to verify that that I got it right. I want I want that visual confirmation that I set the the uh, you know what correctly the radius correctly. Okay, so there's one point. There's a second point, and uh, off we go. All right. All right. So we can do that on oops on the opposite side here too. Okay. All right, so let's uh, let's dink those. All right, cool beans. All right, that one goes to there. to there. Okay, it goes all the way up to that. I just want to verify that it's, that it's going through those points. I can feel it click through there. Hopefully my... It's kind of hard to film. Okay, so you, 
now we kind of have it. So it's one, two, three, four, five. Okay. All right. So let's prick punch. Let's prick punch that. Let's prick punch that. Okay. So now let's use our uh, our straight edge here. So I'm in. I'm in the. Um, I'm in that, I come up to it, rotate over, like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I grab that one. Come over here. Click, click, you hear the, the clickies? In there. It's to, this is a little bit hard to video, um, but uh, I think it's coming out okay. And then we go to here. Like that. Okay, and this is just so you can see the Pentagon, right? We've already established the... Uh, Okay. All right. So, shoop, shoop, shoop. Okay. There's our Pentagon. And so now, if if we were gonna, if this was a flange that we were gonna poke holes there or whatever, then we'd come back with our center punch, which can drop into the prick punch mark nicely. Okay. And then we give that give that a little bit of a little bit of English there, a little harder, and now it'll a drill point or a, uh, the tip of a punch or whatever will go in there. I mean, a, you know, a sheet metal punch or something like that. So anyway, that's the uh, that's one method for doing a graphical, what I would call a graphical layout of a pentagonal bolt circle. The other way is by using a table of constants that you multiply the um, the diameter of the bolt circle by a constant, and what it gives you is it gives you this. And these are called chords here. This is a chord. That's another chord. So it gives you the chordal length when you use the constant method, right? So that's the chordal length right there, which in this case is, let's see what we got here. I don't know. It's two, it's two and, uh, let's, I don't know, two and seven, two and five sixteenths, something like that, a little more than two and five sixteenths. Okay. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I was a little bit clumsy there on, on camera. You, I probably blocked the view a few times with my hand, but uh, hopefully uh, you guys were following along uh, with your, uh, your compasses or your dividers or whatnot. So keep your tips sharp, grind your punches to the correct angle, and, um, and uh, accuracy and intersections matter. So thanks. So we showed this uh, this uh, Rolex thing, uh, I don't know, a couple weeks ago on a, on a meatloaf episode. And um, I, get, uh, I commented on the fact that, uh, that I didn't think that the, uh, um, the lead per revolution was particularly accurate on these things. And there wasn't any published data on, you know, the, the lead accuracy uh, this, you know, for those of you that uh, haven't seen one of these before, these angled rollers make this thing behave like a lead screw, right? Okay, and this one is 200, 200 thousandths per uh, per rev, I think, is what this one is. Okay, yeah, actually, I don't even remember now. Um, but anyway, um, uh, somebody in the comments, and I, I apologize because I can't remember who it was at first, suggested that the diameter of the shaft plays a part in that, right? And so I thought about it a little bit and I said, you know what, I think they're right, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so, but let's try it, okay? And the way I think about um, this kind of a setup here is it's like a thread, right? And um, let's draw a little sketch here. When in doubt, draw a sketch, right? Okay, so, if we have a if we have a, a thread right 
you can represent a thread by drawing a uh, by drawing a triangle like this. Now, please forgive me. I'm I'm drawing upside down here, right? Okay. So, actually, you know what? I'm gonna. So this leg represents your pitch, and this is the circular uh, circumference, and then this is the helical circum. Okay, so it's a triangle, right? So this would be your pitch in inches, and then this is a circumference around the diameter at 90 degrees, right? And then what that does is when you construct that, right, you get an angle, right? All right, so we have an angle, and we'll just call that theta, or, or alpha, excuse me. Um, um, I forgot what I was going to say now. I got so screwed up on my, uh, my Greek letters there. So you have this, um, so this is when, when that one revolution of that thread is equal to this hypotenuse here, right? And, and in fact, uh, if you lay this out accurately on a piece of paper and you cut this out and you wind it around this, you basically get a thread, right? Okay. Um, so now, but, but let's, let's, let's think about this for a sec here. This is the diameter of this particular shaft here, 74820, right? So if we change that, okay, what we're doing is we're, we're changing this, this length here. We're not changing that, okay? We're changing this, right? So let's say that that circular circumference, right? The, the circumference around the diameter, let's say it gets a little longer, right? Okay, I'm arbitrary. So now our helical circumference is now this, okay? Same pitch, we've changed that. So this angle here is now a different angle. Okay, so all these things are, I guess what I'm trying to say here is all these things are kind of interconnected here, right? So if we shorten it, if we shorten it, the same thing happens. Let's say we shorten it, which uh, is the case here, right? Because the circumference of 74820 is different than the circumference of 75000, right? So now this goes like this so once again we've changed we've changed that angle there okay but let's go let's go prove it to ourselves and, and i haven't tried this yet okay i just dug around in all my um, my scrap metal and uh, and uh, this was a shaft we used before and i have another shaft that's uh, that's a few thousandths larger and we're gonna we're gonna try those so let's go try that all right we're gonna try doing this without without bumping the camera here okay so we're, we got everything kind of clamped down, and um, so let's let's preload the indicator a little bit. We'll set that on zero, and then what I want to do is so I get a an accurate starting point there. I'll do what I did before. Is I'll just scratch a little line on there come up and I'll get back on well hopefully that line's long enough there you know what I need that that line needs to be longer it needs to be a pitch length right don't I have that right okay I'll, I'll re-zero the indicator all right that looks pretty good there we'll get close to it Zero the indicator, and I'm going to move one revolution. And I think we saw this before. Let's see, I'm going the right way. Yeah. Get out of the, uh... All right. That looks pretty good. And we're a couple thousandths over. Okay. Which doesn't make any sense, right? Should the lead be longer? I, I don't know. I have to think it through. All right. So that's. This particular shaft, what do we got? We got plus three. All right, so the this one is plus three. All right, now let me take this one out and I'll put the other one in and I'll get set back up here. Our other, sh our other shaft in here now. Let's put our, uh, our little witness mark on there. Should be long enough. Come up just a little 
it? Okay. Let's see, am I on it? I think it rotated a little bit. Okay. That looks pretty good. Let's get that zeroed. Okay. All right, so we're zeroed up. Now, this particular shaft here is uh, 74995. And uh, that was 74820. So they're a little bit different. I, this is all I had. So, uh, you know, ideally I would, you, you know, if you had uh, shafts in 1,000 steps or gauge pins that were long enough, um, you could kind of plot this over, over the diameter, several diameters. So, all right, we're pretty zeroed up here. Let's just try one rev here and see what we get. there hey guess what it's about the same two and a half all right that's that's in the error margin of error for my dodgy setup here well so what is the difference there so that's basically 750 so it's about eight tenths or excuse me uh, two thousandths difference so um, uh, in the diameters approximately so um, um, and uh, we pretty much got the same uh, the same thing. It's plus two and a half uh, on this one here. So uh, plus two and a half. So not definitive yet, I don't think. But uh, I mean, subtly different. Let's see if uh, I go back to. Uh, and I'll go back and I'll come back past. And I'll come up to my mark. It looks pretty good. Oh yeah. So. Maybe it's a tracking error, right? Is uh, there's some slippage in the uh, in the system here? Because I'm not even back. Okay, I'm on my line pretty good there. It looks like I don't have my magnifier, but I got an index error of one and a half thousand. So I don't know what this test is telling us now. So yeah. is pretty kind of crooky looking you know what maybe that's what's going on that line ain't straight <laughs> okay all right we need to we need to redo this here I need a straight line on there um, yeah let me you know what this line look at that line I don't know if you can see that line but it's garbage I didn't notice that all right let me do this again my test setup is well, I think we got a problem with that one too. So, uh, all right, let me reset here. All right, so I think we got a better setup now. I got a nice straight line on there. I put black mark so we can see the difference. This is uh, the uh, 74995, and this is our other one here, and I got a nice straight line on there. So it looks like I'm zeroed up pretty good here. Okay, double check. All right, and I'm gonna do one rev. Get on top of it here. I can see what's going on. Get my magnifier on. Right there. What do we got? One, two, three and a half. All right. So, all right, let's go back to zero. So that was plus three and a half. Let's write that down. Plus three and a half. Back to zero. I'm gonna go past and come up to it just because it feels right. What do we got? Ah, okay, so there is a real index error there. So even with my my crooked line. Yeah, there's enough there's enough wiggle in this whole this whole deal. It's funny because uh, as I rotate this, it feels it feels notchy, like I'm feeling the balls in the ball bearing, right? Maybe one of these bearings is bad because um, that's what it feels like. If, so if I had a shaft in some bearings like this and I felt that, I would go looking at the bearings because it feels like they're brunelled, uh, like there's they're dinked in the um, in the races. So I think we have not answered this question. 
Um, I need to check these bearings, I think, is uh, what I need to do. And um, um, kind of tune up the setup maybe a little bit and then try it again. And maybe find a shaft that uh, has a bigger difference between the diameters. So I would say that this one is not proven yet and uh, requires further research. <laughs> There's where the fun is. So somebody um, commented on the uh, this tubular micrometer in the comments on that meatloaf uh, episode, uh, 134 I think it was, and um, uh, this particular tubular mic was donated by uh, John uh, uh, Ranaletta, and it belonged to a gentleman, Mr. Mr. Fields, who's uh, uh, since uh, uh, since passed now. So, uh, but anyway, uh, the commenter. It was a good comment, and uh, they asked about changing the the rods. And I guess they have one of these, and um, um, have had some trouble changing the rods, or I, I'm not sure what exactly. But it was, a, you know, it was a reasonable comment, and uh, I figured I would uh, kind of go back to this and um, and show how you do that. Okay, so now this is a Lufkin, uh, as we mentioned before, and Lufkins are real nice, and uh, I mean. Just look at that satin chrome and that real fine engraving on there, filled with black. That's just gorgeous, right? Um, so basically, what you can do is this particular one goes from from four to twenty-four inches, uh, and this is an inside micrometer for those folks that don't know. And uh, so you put it inside a bore, and then you you open it up, and then you read your dimension. You read your uh, your inside diameter here. Now, so how do you set that, right? Well, it all kind of it all kind of starts with a micrometer, right? So ideally, you would have a micrometer paired with whatever diameter um, you were working with if you were trying to get absolute uh, absolute numbers, right? So right now, this is uh, in the in the smallest condition here. This is four inches. So what we and we would zero it. And then you can lock the uh, lock the little lock mechanism, okay? And then what you do is you just you measure over it with a uh, with a C clamp, okay? And okay, like so. Now and then I've taken it all the way back to a standard, right? So this is a micrometer standard that we can check our micrometer with, right? And uh, so, so you're you're pretty assured that uh, this is reading correctly, okay? Um, so to change the uh, to change the different sizes, we have these little tools here that come with it. So if you ever see any of these laying around inside a toolbox and you don't know what they are, uh, pretty soon you're going to know what they are, okay? So we have two of these, and they're different sizes, as you can see, and they've been, th they're, they're basically kind of, um, what do we call those? Um, there's a name for this in watchmaking, uh, um, grip wrenches, or so, yeah, I can't think of the name right now, but uh, it's for removing little, little round, smooth things like that, right? Okay, so you, you pinch down on that, and now I can remove this cap, okay, and, Replace it with, and you gotta you gotta make sure these faces are uh, there's no burrs or dirt or anything on the on these faces, because as soon as you change these, you really need to uh, you really need to check you really need to check it again. Let's see, if we get this one. Okay, so uh, also uh, let's uh, let me go back and do that again. That one was a little tighter, and if if you have one that's tight, this branch is a little larger and it actually fits the body here. I can slip it in there. Okay, so it fits the body and now you can hang on to that and uh, put the beans to uh, that in either direction. Okay, like so. Yeah. And I, I always kind of detested using the um, the ones that go on the body because you have to slide them over the neural, right? And um, um, you know, it kind of scuffs up that, that beautiful satin chrome. Sorry, let's take the cap. So this is what happens. You lose the caps, 
and uh, then pretty soon you got a you know a kit that's uh, not worth anything um, to you. Okay, so now we've set it for I don't know what. What have we set that? What have we set that for nominally? We've set that for uh, seven to eight. Okay, so now it, it can go from seven to eight inches. And once again, you would zero it and check it with a micrometer or calipers or something and make sure that you were pretty close, right? And um, um, if you were taking absolute, uh, absolute measurements. Now, um, I think the person that commented was, hey, I don't have the wrenches, what do I do? Good question, right? Well, what I would probably do is make some aluminum jaws um, or a little, and I'll get a little piece of paper here and I'll sketch something in just a second here. Let me put this back because I don't want to lose my, my caps here. Okay, put this all back, shove that forward. What I would do is I would make a little wrench that looks like this. So, just a rectangle like this that has some length to it and then you would bore a hole in it, okay? You would bore a hole that fit that real nicely, right? It would just slip in, right? It'd just slip in. And then what I would do is just bandsaw like this. Okay? All right, and then basically you've cut through to the hole, right? And you know, if you want to make it a little springier, you can you can continue your band sawing a little bit uh, a little bit further. But this hole, this hole here, it needs to be close to this edge here, reasonably close, so that it can uh, it can flex a little bit. Okay, and then you slip it over that, and you pinch down on that, and you have basically the same thing as that. So if you're missing that particular little wrench, that's one way you can get out of trouble there. Um, and once again, so always be sure to uh, um, check your inside mic uh, nominally. Uh, hopefully you have a micrometer um, or something that you can measure 24 inches with uh, accurately. Uh, otherwise you're just kind of shooting blind there. And uh, you're, you're <laughs> There's, there's no external reference, okay? So this is our external reference. Or uh, you can have a length standard like a gauge block and kind of get, uh, get back to an absolute number. Okay, good comment. Thank you very much for that comment. And thank you, Mr. Fields. Uh, he's, in the, uh, he's in the big shop in the sky now. And John Ranaletta for sending this stuff in. So this is a this is another one that a, a bunch of people commented on was this little uh, this little drill point gauge here this little bent bracket and the idea behind this for those that didn't watch that particular video meatloaf 134 um, what they're doing here is they're checking the 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 height or the the equalness of the cutting edges and uh, they're doing that by using a, a fixed reference point. And then just using that corner to scratch a line and then rotating the drill 180 degrees and scratching in a subsequent line. And when you're sharpening a drill, if you if you get the if you get the angles off or the the lip lengths the the wrong length and whatnot, that shows up as a change in height uh, in the, in that cutting edge, right? And it's actually a hard thing to judge when you're grinding a drill by hand, right? Because you're looking at the cutting edge on one side, but you're looking at the clearance on the opposite, so you can't directly compare those. And I've seen a lot of guys, they, they spin it back and forth real fast, and they look at it, they do all kinds of weird stuff, and, uh, and then if you use a, a drill point gauge here, like so, um, you can um, judge where the center is, although it doesn't necessarily tell you that these are at the same point. Okay, so so if you know if you get the angle in the center in the right place, that you know the corner comes out. But if there's a subtle difference in angle, right, that changes where that where that corner is. Okay, so anyway, a lot of people uh, actually commented. They said, "Oh yeah, I used to." In the shop, there was one right next to the grinder, and it was bolted to the column. And uh, there was a can of latex paint there, and they used to slaver 
slather paint over the um, on the thing and you'd scratch a line and then you'd grind it and grind some more and then you know you'd fuss around with it until you got it right and then here's the little there's a, usually in taper shank drills there's a center in it like that and there's a little point there so okay oh, that's all fine and dandy uh oh wait a second what do we do here I mean most of the time I'm not sharpening these too much right I take care of those and they don't get sharpened and when I do I use a drill gauge on them and whatnot so this is you know Joe homeowner here uh, you know hobby shop guy is probably doing drills up to this size or Maybe we have a, you know, we have a set of, uh, of S&D drills like this, right? Uh-oh, same problem, right? Okay, so now what? Well, I made one of these. So I wanted to try it, so I just went ahead and, and made this thing up. And literally, it took a few minutes, okay? It wasn't uh, anything, uh, it's, there's nothing magical here. Okay, so let's get rid of that. There's nothing magical here. And you know what? I, I better check the shot and make sure that uh, we can see everything. But the, the idea is it's got a V that kind of locates the drill and consistently between the two sides, right? Uh, this might be ripe for 3D printing too. So uh, for those folks that, uh, that have 3D printers, this might be a good, uh, a good 3D print. Although, uh, I don't know. Uh, anyway, you know, sometimes there's problems printing uh, overhanging things. But let's uh, let me set the camera up a little differently, and then uh, we'll, we'll give it a try because I think that's out of the shot. Actually, you know what? I could do it like this. Let's do it like this. I'm just going to hold it up in there. Make sure I'm make sure I'm in the in the meat. There's the corner. Okay. There's our there's our line. I'm going to rotate it 180. I'm going to do it again. Okay, so this drill looks pretty good. So those match up real nice. And actually, this looks like it's been reground. Boy, I wonder, wonder who did that. Whoever did it did a really nice job. I'm just kidding. I probably did that on my, uh, my drill grinder. But anyway, that's the idea there. And uh, that actually works. You can just kind of hold it up there in, with your hand and then give it a little, a little scratch. Hold it up again, give it another little scratch. And then, you know, okay, we want to do it again. Now, I, I put dicum on this um, um, just because I like the smell of it. <laughs> but Sharpie would probably work just as good. Let's try that real quick. Let's just try it here. Okay, anyway, yep. Oops, I didn't scratch it, did I? Okay, so we got a good scratch. So anyway, there it is. Um, this is just aluminum and bolted together, two pieces, milled a little uh, kind of e-block in it, and Bob's your uncle. So drill point gauge. And thanks for the comments. Uh, that was kind of cool. Uh, I had never played with one, and uh, now I got to play with one. And this is going to live back near the uh, near the bench grinder where I sharpen drills. All right, this, this next question here that came through really has to do with um, uh, face mills or large diameter mills, we'll call them, um, for uh, Bridgeport or, you know, kind of smaller hobby sized machines, right? So uh, how, do, how do you choose a face mill um, for your Bridgeport, right? Well, it's actually kind of a thorny, a, a thorny problem, right? It's a problem with a lot of variables that you're trying to, opt, trying to optimize a solution for. Okay, so you got so some of the factors that were that, that were taken into consideration is uh, is the tool cost initially, right? Okay, dollars, right? And then the the insert cost, right? So how much, you know? I don't want to, um, you know, spend all my money on, on inserts, right? You know, I want them to last and, uh, um, you know, I don't want them to be a million dollars, right? And be readily available, right? So, and then, you know, what's the, what's the range of materials, right? Okay, what's the range of materials, right? So. Can I machine everything that I want to machine, right? Uh, from plastics to uh, Hastelloy, right? 
And, um, and I'll tell you the answer is no. There's no magic solution for every material. That's why you see three here, okay? Um, and then, you know, everybody's trying to opt to get the uh, uh, maximum tool diameter, okay? And this ties back into the available horsepower. Oops, horsepower. <laughs> horsepower. I can spell, trust me. Available horsepower and RPM available on your machine, which is, you know, 3,000 RPM, something like that, right? And uh, you know, surface finish. You know, you could you could go on and you could go on and on. So everybody wants a good surface finish, right? And then the last one that's kind of important that in in this kind of you know abbreviated list here is the ability to mill to a shoulder. Okay. So what I mean by that is when you have a when you have a, a face mill like this that has a lead angle on it, right? You, you can't mill a square shoulder, right? So, you know, if you want to mill a, a corner like that, right? Okay, no can do, right? You get 45 degrees with that one, okay? Now, this one will, this one will mill to a sho shoulder, okay? And this one sort of mills to a shoulder, okay? Uh, it's, it's pretty good, but it's not perfectly 90 degrees, okay? Because they have a little relief angle on that. So what the heck do you do? <laughs> what do you do? So you're trying to balance these variables here, right? Um, low initial cost, your insert cost, your materials, your tool diameter, blah, 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 right? Well, it's an old problem, I'll tell you. And um, what I've done, my answer to that particular problem is I just kind of divide the materials that I'm working on uh, using these kinds of tools into kind of two categories, right? Okay, so I just say, let's make sure that's on screen. Hard stuff, soft stuff, okay? So this is um, steel, cast iron, stainless, um, uh, okay, and this is uh, plastic, aluminum, uh, lead, uh, I don't machine much lead, I'm just using it as an example, um, you know, maybe phenolic, okay, or um, um, bra brass, brass is not actually really soft, but it has some strange characteristics. And, you know, bronze might end up over here, okay? And it also might end up over here, too, because there's some very hard bronzes, okay? Manganese bronze is a good one, but then there's uh, uh, le leaded bronze, okay? Uh, um, or tellurium bronze or something like that that's actually quite soft, okay? So some of those kind of bounce back and forth. So now what I've done is say, okay, here's group one and here's group two, right? So let's, let's get a, a, a tool that works for this and let's get a tool that works for that, right? Um, and then, so this is kind of the solution here, right? Graphically. So hard stuff, soft stuff, okay? Um, and my uh, shoulder milling thing I get with this, right? Now, it's not perfect, okay? And I'll admit that, that it's not perfect. And there's a million choices out there, right? And that's why videos about carbide inserts are very difficult to do because there's just literally thousands of choices. And it's really driven by the job that you're doing, right? That drives the process, right? So if you have to do that job in Hastelloy um, and, um, um, and, and with a particular surface finish, that's going to that's gonna zero you in on some choices with the, the tool manufacturers and the insert manufacturers uh, to kind of optimize that solution, right? So the short answer is there is not a general solution that works for everything, okay? So just forget about that. Just get that out of your head. It doesn't work. Um, this is a reasonable compromise thinking about hard stuff and soft stuff. And this covers a large range, although it's not perfect for everything. So that's kind of the answer I gave this fellow. 
uh, when he actually it was an email that he sent me. But I realized that this is a problem in the hobby community, right, or the home shop machinist community, right? Is hey, I got limited funds, I got limited horsepower. Uh, but I want the best solution that covers the most ground, right? So it's a really common question. So this particular one works really good. It's got a lead angle. It works on a variety of materials. You can get some different insert geometries for it. Problem is the inserts are not particularly cheap, okay? They're in the $20 a piece range. Ooh, 20, 40, 60. Okay, that's starting to get expensive. Now they got four edges on them, so blah blah. Okay, fine. Yada yada yada. Right, that works. Um, it's got an integral shank, uh, so it's pretty stable. Not much overhang, which is something that you want for low horsepower machines like a Bridgeport. Okay, it's got the R8 in it, right? Um, so it works good on uh, on steel, on stainless, and uh, cast iron, uh, things like that. And the inserts seem to hold up pretty good. These are Iskar inserts inserts. This tool is made by Glacern, okay, GMT, <coughs> and they're online, and I don't remember what the tool cost. Actually, somebody gave it to me, and I started using it, and I kind of liked it, so Glacern. So it's, it's G-L-A. Okay, all right. Now, this one here, this is a, uh, a Sarah tip made by Cairo Sarah, and um, these have Cermet inserts in them, and this thing will batter its way through pretty much uh, any kind of uh, ferrous uh, uh, metal or stainless steel. Uh, it does not work on, uh, on aluminum and whatnot. Um, and it'll mill up to a shoulder. Now the problem with this one is, um, is the chips that come off of this are basically kind of, all the heat from the cutting goes into the chip and it flies off and uh, basically catches your shop on fire. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kidding a little bit, right? But the chips are very, very hot and uh, they fly a long distance because you're running this at uh, uh, 1500 RPM or something like that and, uh, you know, in steel or stainless and, brrr, and plowing your way through. You guys have seen me use this before. Um, but it leaves a nice finish, it cuts really well, and the inserts are relatively cheap. Okay, these are TPG 322s, uh, just a uh, triangular insert with a little bit of relief. You get three corners off of them, uh, and they're not, they're not too expensive. Okay, and then this one, everybody should have one of these. Um, this is an AB Tools Shear Hog. Okay, AB Tools and uh, shear hog and it's really designed for aluminum but it works across a, a wide range of materials uh, soft materials uh, it's got a polished insured geometry that you could shave with this thing it's so sharp uh, this is works you know just a very wide range of soft materials and just really removes material uh, two insert edges inserts are about 20 bucks a piece um, and you know for the polished ones you can get them with different corner radii um, and the inserts work in all the all the tools uh, they have a, a pretty good selection of uh, you know one's large diameter shell mills and then small diameter shank tools like this so uh, um, if I was gonna buy one tool here um, I would get this one and uh, and then use uh, end mills um, uh, for my hard stuff, you know, just regular uh, carbide end mills or or high speed and uh, with cooling. Anyway, I don't want to drone on too much about this, but uh, that was a really good question, and I'm sure a lot of people have been thinking about this uh, this multivariate problem here and uh, trying to find a solution. So uh, anyway, hope this helps.